Well, again, good day, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on maintaining your incubators. Uh, welcome also to our Spanish-speaking customers. Bienvenido también a nuestros clientes que hablan español. La próxima semana tendremos la misma clase, y si desea verlo en próximo martes, en lugar de hoy, puede visitar www.chicmaster.com y registraje allí, uh, ahí ahora. Uh, my name is Mark Sintel, and I am the Vice President of Customer Care for Chickmaster. And I'd just like to welcome everyone. And while we can't see each other in person as easily right now, we are really honored that you would choose to join with us virtually to talk about maintaining your incubators. We're going to be having these webinars uh, every week uh, over the next couple months. If you have any questions during the presentation today, don't hesitate to use the Q&A button or the chat buttons uh, that are in your uh, browser, and we will address those questions throughout the presentation. You may also raise your hand, again virtually, if you'd like to ask a question, and we will unmute your microphone for a moment, but please be aware that we are recording this presentation and it may be available to others uh, online later. So our presenter today is uh, Craig Harrison. Uh, Craig has been with Chickmaster for 13 years. He has led our service organization in Europe uh, for much of that, and he also oversees our global training initiatives. And so Craig has a wealth of knowledge about incubation and the mechanical aspects of our incubators. And you're about to drink from a fire hose of information as Craig shares some of that experience with us. So uh, Craig, if you're there without any further introduction, uh, I'd like to uh, for you to take over and. Uh, Thank you so much for being with us, Craig. Thank you very much, Mark, and uh, welcome to the inaugural Technical Tuesday, everybody. Um, so my name's Craig Harrison. As Mark mentioned, I've been with Chickmaster, a service manager for Europe, Middle East, and Africa for the last 13 years. And my priority is to assist our customers to achieve great incubation using our machines. Staying on that topic, the first Technical Tuesday will be around the topic of incubator maintenance. First of all, we'll run over the benefits of good incubator maintenance both proactive and reactive. Spend a little bit of time reviewing best practices for the calibration of your machines before moving on to the preset checklist, which can help identify a lot of issues. Then we'll finish on the recording of the, the information that we've gathered, a little bit of discussion of how that can benefit you before moving on to a question and answer session to fill in any, fill in any gaps that I've left. If you've got any questions as you progress, as Mark mentioned, please drop them in the chat box and we'll address them as we're able to. So the topics for today's discussion, first of all, we're gonna quickly run through the benefits of maintenance. First of all, it's worth spending a little bit of time just clarifying exactly what we mean by maintenance. This can easily be split down into two main groups. You have reactive maintenance, which most hatcheries don't have a choice about doing. This is where you're actively repairing something once it's already broken. In not doing it means that you have a machine down or your production is directly impacted by that fault. So this is things like repairing a, a fan belt once it's already broken or replacing a solenoid once it's already broken. The counterpoint to that is proactive maintenance. Now proactive maintenance will prolong the life of your incubators. So your machines will be in good working order for a longer period of time from the point of sale. There's absolutely no reason why a well-maintained Chickmaster incubator shouldn't still be giving you fantastic results 30 years after its purchase. Now, proactive maintenance is largely split into a couple of different groups. The main one is gonna be your mechanical. So these are things like replacing belts before they've worn, replacing relays before they've welded closed or have a fault on them, calibrating your machines. Side by side to that, you have cosmetic, proactive maintenance as well. So this is replacing the silicon on your machines, which whilst sounds purely cosmetic, will directly impact and assist in keeping or help your incubator healthy through the duration of its life. If you're not maintaining the silicon on your machines, you can very easily get detergent and moisture ingress in between the panels and the aluminium trim, and that'll lead to a early deterioration of the integrity of the cabinet and give you a risk of biocide infection as well, contamination within your machine. Now, proactive maintenance will reduce the need for reactive maintenance in your machine. The obvious example to that is fan belts. Everybody that runs our incubators and anybody that knows, anybody that runs a system that has fans and belts in their system knows that belts largely won't survive a two year period. 
they'll run quite happily for 12 months and then in that 12 to 24 month period you'll see an up, uptake in the number of failures that you're having on that hardware you've got two options you can either wait for that fan belt to break in which case your staff get a call out in the middle of the night to repair it and you have a loss of production and a potential loss of stock whilst that fault occurs or you can be proactive about it if you know after 12 months your belts are going to start fa failing why not replace them early it will reduce unscheduled downtime for you it'll reduce the amount of call out hours that you're getting out of normal alphas hours and the dangers associated with that of having lone workers on your site and it'll also give you a peace of mind that your incubators are going to be running in tip-top condition the obvious um, justification for this is the higher profits that you're going to get from your site by reducing any production losses Proactive maintenance will also give you an in a noticeable increase in chick quality and hatchability by giving you uniform incubation conditions. That's not only uniform, in uniform incubation conditions from machine to machine, but also through the life of an incubator. I, I can count on, I can count quite happily the number of sites that I've been to where justification for poor hatching is given is because the incubators are 20 years old. That shouldn't be a valid excuse for incubators hatching below standard. If incubators are well maintained, they should still be incubating well 20 years after they were installed is the day they were first installed. Now, one of the main points of um, proactive maintenance on your incubators is gonna be calibration. Now, this is split down into two port portions. For me, the most important portion of this is your temperature calibration. The reason for this is small errors in temperature calibration will have a very quick and large noticeable impact on your hatchability and chick quality inside your incubators. So what are you going to need to calibrate? The first thing you're going to need is a good known calibration kit. At the moment, our calibration kit for the for Chick Master is called the RC2 or the Resonance Calibration Kit. Um, the part number for this Porsche for this kit is on the screen and this is a, as I said, is a wireless kit. So you whilst you still have wired probes going back to the box that then is a battery powered kit so you can carry it around the hatchery without having leads through your doors and instigating a tripping hazard into your facility as part of that kit it's vital that you have a known good reference point so this is your mercury or other master thermometer which is regularly calibrated by an external company to ensure that it's giving you an accurate and consistent reading if that reference point isn't accurate and it isn't trusted your calibration procedure however you're carrying it out is diminished a mass a great deal the calibration kits that we've had over the years the picture at the bottom of this page a lot of you will recognize is the old black box still a fantastic calibration kit the biggest problem we've had historically with this is the cables in the corridor which is why we've designed those out of the kit when do you calibrate your machines the obvious one is at irregular intervals. So you, regardless of whether or not you've identified a potential problem on your incubators, you want to be calibrating those machines at least at once every six months. So you, that's something you can schedule well in advance. You know, six months after the, your previous calibration, you're going to be doing that again. So you can schedule that in amongst your production schedule quite happily. On top of that, you want to be calibrating any time you change any hardware on that machine that result that in the um, controls that temperature regulation. So that's your temperature probes, your PT 100s on a gen four, gen three and an ultra control. You're going to have one of those per zone and on a rock control, you're going to have two of those probes per zone. If any of those get changed because of mechanical damage or perceived uh, weakness in those readings, you need to recalibrate once that's been done. The reason being, your calibration value is based on the resistance within that electrical circuit. And as soon as you change any hardware, that resistance changes and your calibration offset will change appropriately. Secondary to that is any time you have any issues with hatchability or production. So if you notice that your hatchability drops by a percentage point or uh, something changes, your rear zone of your machine changes, the first thing that we're going to ask or an incubation specialist is going to ask is when was the last time you calibrated that machine? Having that answered ready to hand and then knowing that your calibrated value that's currently in the machine is true and can be relied, relied upon 
is a great first step and allows us to then focus on other mechanical aspects in the machine. Hey, Craig, uh, we have a question that has come in. Uh, could you just review once again uh, the difference between this kit and the previous one? And uh, will the, uh, the new RC2 kit uh, work with older models as well? <laughs> Yeah, yes, absolutely is a simple answer. So the, re the difference between the two kits is purely that the RC2 can be carried around the hatchery and it does not need to be plugged into a mains power whilst you're calibrating. So it comes complete with a battery. You can charge it through a nor any normal USB Type-C, which is the co correctly known as a printer cable. Um, charge it up and it's good for a couple of days worth of use. You can leave the RC2 kit on top of a machine and drop the drop the probes down through into the into the machine which means that you reduce or well actually you remove the trip, potential trip hazard of having a kit sat in the corridor where your operators are transferring eggs the kit's fully backwards compatible so there's absolutely no reason why you can't use the rc2 on an older incubator and um, it's just one of the benefits of having the rc2 is it does have up to eight probes built into it whereas the older kit um, previously only equip, came equipped with four. The reason we've increased that is to accommodate the rock control, which as I mentioned earlier, it's got two probes per zone as opposed to just the one. So how do you know when your calibration's out? So the first thing to note is inconsistent or incorrect calibration will very quickly lead to green chicks if your calibration is too high. So that is to say at the end of those 21 days of incubation for chickens, your birds don't look fully grown yet. They don't look fully developed. Some of them might still be in their shell and the ones that are out of their shells are still gonna look very wet. That telltale humidity peak that you would see on the last 12 to 18 hours in your hatcher is gonna be offset slightly from where you expect it and your hatch window may be elongated as well. That's a telltale sign that your calibration value is just too high. So it's being put in by anything up to a couple of tenths of a degree. The opposite side of that is having chicks at takeoff that are just too stressed. They're extremely dehydrated. They're potentially malformed, depending on where the humidity, sorry, where the temperature calibration was, is off, whether it's the setter or the hatcher. Now the graph on the right hand side of this page is indicative of what you'd see in a setter with the calibration offset being too low. At the very top of this graph, you can see the cooling load for zone one on the red line and zone two on the orange line. So this is right at the top of the graph. I'm looking just up here. Uh, these two lines just here. So over on the left hand side of the maestro, we can see that zone one's been cooling for 12% of the time and zone two's been cooling for 0%. These two zones are in effect fighting each other for the condition inside the cabinet. To me, that tells me that one of those zones is calibrated either too high or the other zone is calibrated too low. Now, how do you calibrate? For best practice, you need to use a known good reference point. So this goes back to the importance of having a, a very good, reliable calibration kit within your facility. So once you've got a known good calibration kit within your hatchery, you need to consistently test that. So periodically you need to take that kit along with your known good thermometer and put them in, a, in an environment where you can monitor a stable temperature. If your hatchery has got a vaccine facility in it, so you have the, the equipment to put vaccines into your, either your chicks or your eggs, what you'll often have is a water bath, which you can dial up to a, a known temperature, leave your probe and your thermometer in there and just make sure that both of those are reading the same value. If you lack that equipment, which is exceedingly common in smaller and medium sized hatcheries, what you're able to do instead is put maybe a five gallon bucket of water inside an incubator, wait until it's up to incubation temperature and stick both of your probes in there. Now the reason we use a reasonably large body of water is for stability. The last thing you want is fluctuations in that temperature whilst you're trying to validate those readings. Because what you'll often find is your mercury thermometer is going to change temperature exceedingly quickly within a couple of seconds, whereas the probe on your calibration box may take several minutes for it to stabilize at a new temperature. And any changes in temperature, what you're looking for is those both probes following that temperature trend in the same time. For a wireless temp calibration kit, 
your battery level must be greater than 50%. And that's actually a feature that's programmed into the Chickmaster calibration app to ensure that you're getting great calibration with all of our equipment. The reason for that is when batteries start to deplete, the voltage can vary on them. So to ensure that you're getting a great reading, that's a safeguard that's built into all of our software. If you are using one of the older kits, which is main supplied, and you're in an area of the world where the incoming voltage isn't necessarily stable, it's highly recommended that a voltage regulator is used for exactly the same reason that the temperature readings are impacted by the voltage of the equipment that it's been supplied with. Once you know that your calibration kit is safe and secure, and it's gonna give you known good readings, then you can start putting it into the incubator. If you're fortunate enough to have calibration ports on the roof of your machine, you can drop them straight down to a known length into the, where the probe location is. Whereas on the older, older incubators, you may need to go through the doors. If that's the case, calibration is gonna take a little bit longer because once you've opened the doors, you need to let the, the environment within that cabinet stabilize. For a single stage machine, for our Vedas, the ideal time to calibrate is four to six days into the incubation cycle. Once those eggs are set, you can shut up the door, make sure the damp is closed, pull out the relays for the heating and cooling to make sure the temperature is not going to suddenly spike or drop inside the machine to make sure it's nice and stable and leave those probes in there for 30 to 60 minutes until the temperature is absolutely stable. For a multi-stage, for a classic machine, the ideal time to calibrate the machine is two days after you've set eggs. So multi-stage, for those that aren't aware, is an ongoing cycle and every three to four days you're going to be putting new eggs into those machines and you're looking for that window around two days after egg set where again the temperature is nice and stable. Once the probes are in there you want to leave them as I mentioned for 30 to 60 minutes to ensure the environment is nice and stable. Monitor the temperature on your screen and input those values into the HMI or the touch screen on the front of the machine. The calibration process doesn't stop there. Once you've input those values, you want to monitor them for another 10 to 15 minutes just to ensure that any changes that happen on the probe for the machine are duplicated by the probe on your calibration box as well. So that's a double check just to make sure that the, and to validate the figure that you've put in. Once you've put the calibrated value into the machine and you've verified it, you want to record those values. So recording your calibrated values is very important for a couple of reasons, which we'll go into a bit more detail on now. First of all, it gives you tracking. It gives you the ability to look back at the history of that machine in that in individual probe as to what the historical nature of that probe is. That is great from a fault finding point of view and for your proactive maintenance. The reason being, when hardware starts to fail, when electrical components start to fail, what you'll generally see is an exponential increase in the deviation for that sensor. Um, so that's signified by the, the yellow line on the graph on the right hand side of this slide, where you can see consistently the reading for the yellow probe was around minus 0.1 Celsius. And then gradually that's increased up to 0 0.3, 0 0.6, and then eventually 1.3. So those figures will get greater and greater and greater. Now, eventually our control will automatically flag, flag that up for you as a probe failure on the machine. But by the time that's been spotted, it's feasible if you're, if you're calibrating once a year or once every six months, that that calibrated value has been out for up to six months. And that will have a direct and measurable impact on your hatchability. Whereas if you're monitoring these figures, it'll, it'll give you an indication that there's a problem far earlier. So what you're looking for on this one is any sudden changes in those values. Logging these values also allows you to give comparisons directly between individual probes within a machine and also between machines on an individual site. So if you have 12 incubators on your site and they all of them without question calibrate to around 0.6 of a degree or below, but you have one incubator that requires a 1.2 offset, you know something's not quite right with that last incubator and it allows you to justify any hardware replacements far easier. Craig, uh, we have a, uh, just a question or two on calibration on temperature. Um, first, would the process be any different uh, for say an old ultra setter machine? Uh, ultras aren't something I've, I've got a great deal of experience on, okay. unfortunately. Um, now the, the mechanics of, of calibrating 
um, it's you still need to do it in the same sort of time frame. So minimum of around six months in between. But exactly how, how you'd go about and carrying out that calibration is not something I'm intimately familiar with. Um, if you've got specific questions on a control platform that we're not covering today, and most of today's material is on a Gen 4 or a rock control, by all means, uh, drop me a note or drop your service lead for your territory note afterwards. We can get you more specific, tailored information for you. That's great. And uh, you can always email support at chickmaster.com, support at chickmaster.com if you have specific questions. And uh, we will research uh, and get a specific answer for your uh, specific controller. Also, one other question, uh, why four to six days instead of the second day uh, as far as when you do the calibration, Craig? So the second day of incubation on a, on, a, on a Vita, your temperature regulation is still going to be fluctuating quite a lot. So depending on exactly the condition of your eggs when you put them in, whether you pre-warm them or not before putting them into the setter, your, your temperature environment within that set is still going to be fighting to get the eggs from their exothermic, sorry, from their endothermic state from the egg store up to the incubation temperature. So doing that at, at day four to day six allows you to have a far more stable environment within that incubator. Now, obviously, if you are pre-warming eggs, so you're getting them up to 20, 25 degrees in the corridors or in another room prior to load them in the setter, then that four to six days can be brought forward. It, it's a rule of thumb, it's not a hard and fast rule, and it's absolute flexibility to allow for individual sites um, and peculiarities and different operational parameters. One more question has come in, uh, Craig, on what range of values can be considered as good or perfect calibration? Can you speak to that at all? Yeah, absolutely. So a, a Gen 4 control with an Allen Brad, uh, sorry, a Gen 4 control with an Allen Bradley PLC will give you a, a, a probe failure if you try and calibrate a probe at an offset of greater than 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit. And for a Gen 4 Omron PLC, it'll give you the same probe failure at 2.5 degrees Fahrenheit offset. So that's what we consider to be too great of an offset for that set, for those sets of hardware. Um, but a lot of it comes down to the experience of the individual site, which is why recording these values is so important. Um, your offset values is impacted massively by, as I mentioned earlier, the resistance of the cable. Now that's impacted by relative humidity, ambient temperature, uh, barometric pressure, and the age of the cables as well. So if you're consistent, if you're consistently calibrating your incubators to 1.2 degrees, and that's repeatable, then it's absolutely fine. It's not a problem. If, however, you're consistently in calibrating your machines to 0.2 Fahrenheit, and then you've got one incubator that jumps up to 1.2, then that individual incubator is a potential problem. Okay, Craig, thank you. Um, uh, we're also getting some questions about uh, uh, range of values for Avitas and Jameric 2s. Do you have any uh, offhand you know of those or should we respond offline to those? So the, the Avita values are going to be the same as ones I've just mentioned. So the Gen 4 controls, whether they're on Classics or Avitas, it's the same values that are hard-coded into the machine. It's the same hardware that we use between the probes and the controls. So you're looking for 1.4 Fahrenheit for an Allen Bradley control and 2.5 maximum for a Omron control. And then for a Jumeric 2, I think the values that we allow are slightly, slightly lower, so about 1.2 Fahrenheit, but that's something I'd have to check and come back to you with. All right, we have a question uh, from uh, Andy. He'd like to ask it by voice. And so uh, Andy, I'm gonna allow you to talk and ask your question. Uh, you could unmute yourself uh, or lower your hand if that was a mistake. All right, Andy, I have uh, unmuted you. Okay, that does not appear to be functioning. So Andy, just type your question in if you don't mind. And uh, while he's doing that, uh, I have another question has come in. Um, so in a multi-stage machine, after the first setting of the eggs, if we calibrate six days, uh, only the settings in the machine, then will it calibrate accurately? Uh, no is a simple answer. So on the problem of multi-stage machines is when you first load those machines with eggs, you've obviously got a far lower capacity of eggs inside that machine. Your temperature, your temperature control within that cabinet is going to be all over the place until that cabinet's full. 
So you're talking about sort of that three week cycle until you've got all of the eggs in. And that's when you're going to get a great calibration inside that machine. That, however, that's not to say you shouldn't calibrate on new, on new machines. You absolutely should, but you should do it with your eyes open that you're going to need to redo it again three weeks down the line. Okay. Um, just a few more on calibration. This is a, a hot topic for people. Um, you see what I just did there? Hot topic, temperature, cal never mind. Uh, can we uh, calibrate empty machines? Can we calibrate empty machines? You can calibrate empty machines, but you're not going to get a good reading. So as part of the commissioning of the machines, we'll do an, an empty calibration, which is primarily to um, test the functionality of the calibration and make sure that there's no erroneous readings there. But the, the problem with an empty cabinet is much like trying to calibrate a half empty classic machine is your temperature stabilization of that, that cabinet is going to be all over the place. Now the egg mass itself, the sheer amount of fluid that's in a full machine is that that gives us that stability for the temperature control inside the cabinet. And that's what leads you to having great calibration values. Okay. Uh, another question here, uh, in how much time um, will it take an Avita to reach its target temperature after loading eggs? Uh, if it's equipped with electric heaters only and maybe four hours of preheating? Um, oh, that's a good question. So there's a lot of, there's unfortunately a lot of what ifs um, loaded in this answer. So your, your time to get up to incubation temperature is going to differ on a, a couple of different things. So it depends your, your egg storage temperature. So obviously if you're preheating, you're going to be negating a, a, a large portion of that. And it depends on the amount of electric heating available in your machine. Now 90% of our Avidas out there have got a thousand watt heating elements, four per zone. So you've got four kilowatts of heating per zone. And we'd expect that machine to be up to temperature in around 10 hours. Now, as standard in most of our Avidas for the last few years, we've, had been, we've been prompting customers to get hot water heating, which will pull that down to around three and a half to four hours, depending on the boiler capacity on the site, um, which will obviously have a dramatic decrease in your hatch window at the other end of the incubation cycle as well, because it gets all of the eggs up to that incubation temperature in a much shorter time frame. All right, just one or two more, and then we'll let you move on. And again, I'll remind all of our listeners, uh, that if you have specific conditions, uh, feel free to email us at, at a support at chickmaster.com, and we'd be happy to have a more complete conversation. Uh, so uh, one or two more on a classic machine. Uh, do you still need to shut the cooling and heating off to calibrate? Yes, okay. is a simple answer. So you, you, the, the absolute worst case you can get for a calibration is you, you put all of the effort in to make sure that you have a, a known good reference point. You take the time out of your day, so you have a couple hours set aside to do a handful of machines. You get yourself a nice expensive calibration kit. You set it up inside the machine. You monitor it for 30 to 60 minutes. And just prior to you taking the calibration reading, the PLC detects a slight variance in the temperature, kicks in the heating and or the cooling. And your temperature probe then reads a tenth of a degree or two tenths of a degree different to the machine probe. Okay. And when you calibrate, you're in effect putting in the wrong temperature reading. So by turning the, pulling those relays off and disabling the heating and the cooling, your temperature in the cabinet will gradually decrease, but that's absolutely fine. And it's on a very slow decrease. So it's something that you can manage through the, through the, through the calibration process. Right. Um, for wet bulb probes in a multi-stage machine, uh, should, would it be better to calibrate around the running range or around the dry bulb or, or is around the dry bulb okay? Uh, so if it's a wet bulb probe, that you're absolutely fine calibrating it to a, to a dry PT100 calibration box. So if it's a wet bulb humidity probe, you can take the wick off and calibrate it that way. Uh, that's absolutely fine. If you're asking about calibrating dry humidity, um, th there's two options. Either you can spend money to get a RH calibration probe and verify it that way, or you can put a wick onto a Onto, onto the calibration probe to get yourself a wet bulb reading and then convert it over. But you need to be absolutely sure that your temperature is again stable in the machine because uh, relative humidity varies massively with the temperature of the air it's, it's recorded in. All right, um, I'm gonna ask, um, ask you just two more and uh, then we'll move on uh, and we'll 
we'll uh, respond uh, offline to any other calibration of temperature questions. Uh, first, do they need calibration tools too to make sure the calibration tool works correctly? Um, so the only thing you need in addition to the calibration box is going to be that that mercury reference. Um, so I know mercury is a, a contentious point internationally now. It's very difficult to ship and it's very difficult to source. There are some good mineral alternatives out there which still give very good reading. So when I say mercury thermometer, it's really mercury or a, a comparable alternative. But what you're after is a known good reference point that can sit in a cupboard, send it to an external company just to verify that it's good. And that's your that's your your Bible in effect. That's your known good point that you then use that to calibrate your calibration box. And then once you've got con consistency and reliability with your calibration box, you can use that on the rest of your incubators. Very good. All right, Craig, go ahead and uh, and move us forward. Thank you all for your questions, everyone. And uh, feel free to put some more in. I uh, use the Q and A box uh, if possible, and uh, we'll respond to those offline uh, as Craig moves forward. Thank you. So once you've got a good temperature calibration in your incubators, to me, the next most important portion is going to be your turning angles. This is um, not strictly calibration, but it's still an important aspect to make sure it's absolutely right, because any turn angle below 38 degrees will have a direct measurable impact on your hatchability coming out of those machines. Now, turning should be checked prior to each set. So this is part of the preset checklist that we'll come on to in a bit more detail in a moment. What you're looking for when you're checking those turn angles is consistency. You're looking for consistency of turn angle between the trolleys and a machine. So between the front and the rear of the machine and from the left to the right of the machine, are those angles the same? Within a single trolley, so the, the trolley shown here is a double stacked. We do have a number of machines out there with triple stack, but do all of the, the, the stacks of eggs within that trolley have the same turn angles? And then across the machine as well, you're looking for the turn angles to be consistent both directions. So when the actuators are fully extended and when the actuators are fully retracted to the left and to the right, are they nice and consistent? Now, proactive maintenance should be done when it's needed. Obviously, if you find something that's physically broken, that's into the realms of reactive maintenance and it needs to be rectified before the machine is used. When you are looking to do maintenance, proactive maintenance on trolleys. The easiest things to, to look at to, in order to get a, a good return on investment are your link bars, your hanger bars, and any other mechanical wear points within your trolleys. The next slide along shows us what happens after, this is a 20 year old incubator and a customer with on, on trolley turning that hasn't been doing any proactive maintenance on their trolleys. And as you can see, the top of the hanger bars is just, it's worn clear through. The problem with this is they're only achieving about 20 degrees turn angles in their incubators. By replacing the hanger bars, they very quickly saw an increase in their hatchability, uh, not only because the turn angles being improved, but also the airflow within the incubator was improved as well. Now, when you turn the eggs in the incubator, the egg flats move closer together, which restricts the airflow somewhat. And it actually aids, it's actually aids the, uni the uniform airflow within our cabinet. When you've got a trolley or a bank of trolleys that aren't turning at those angles, it gives a path of easier resistance for the airflow. And when we're pushing nice conditioned airflow around those cabinets, it will take the path of least resistance. So if you've got two trolleys side by side, one with a, a terrible turn angle of say 15 to 20 degrees and one with a better turn angle of 35 to 40 degrees, you'll have the bulk of the conditioned air going through the trolley with the le least turn angle, starving the airflow going through the, the countering machine. And that's where you get inconsistencies within the cabinet. Now I've mentioned a few times through this about a preset checklist. So what's it for? Craig, real quick, um, uh, before you move on to a preset checklist, uh, just one question on turning. Uh, do you suggest that we stop turning after day 15? Are there any benefits to that? And um, there's certainly been some, some work um, in that. That's, that's not something, it's not a topic that I'm overly comfortable drawing conclusions on. It's all work that's been fairly new, but I know we, a lot of our customers have seen 
um, pretty good results with increasing the turn time in the early stages of incubation, so maybe turning every 15 minutes, and then throughout the, the throughout the time in a setter, backing that time off, and then by sort of day 15, day 16, stopping the turning. Um, but that's something that's really more a topic for one of our incubation specialists. So okay. certainly if, if somebody would like to go and delve into more detail than that, feel free to get in contact with us after this seminar. That's right. And Tolga, who asked the question, uh, we'll be happy to have a, an incubation specialist from your region uh, give you a call back after this to talk about that. Go ahead, Craig. So the preset checklist, it's there so the maintenance staff can sign the machine back over into operation with the confidence that the machine is going to be in absolute best condition to deliver great incubation. It also gives a nice window for the maintenance staff, which is scheduled prior to each use of a couple of hours where they can carry out any proactive and reactive maintenance. So what is the preset checklist? Largely, it can be split into two different portions. You've got the condition of the machine and you've got the function of the machine. So by condition of the machine, Sorry, by function of the machine, what I'm referring to is the mechanical functions of the machine. So physically, what is it able to carry out? So this is where you're going to go through the testing screens and physically check the heating and the cooling. Do they activate? The damper function, does it open and close correctly into the correct uh, tolerances? Does the humidity, if it's installed on the machine, active? And does the fan alarm work? What's the condition, alignment and tightness of the belt? also gives you an opportunity to clean out the control cabinet whilst it's not live. Now for the condition of the machine, these are a preventative maintenance tasks which should be carried out on every, incub in every incubator periodically, whether it's a setter or a hatcher, single stage or multi-stage. So these, this is where you have an opportunity to check the belt tension, replace the wick on an incubator if it's installed, and grease any bearings or oil points. So any points in the machine that have got mechanical wear or the opportunity for mechanical wear should be lubricated to ensure that you're not wearing away the metal as much as possible and to avoid any interaction between those dissimilar metals. It gives you an opportunity to clean residue from surfaces. So not only in your control cabinet, but maybe silicon on joins within the machine to replenish that and replace it. And also allows you time to clean and change any strainers on humidity lines. Now, during this process, it's highly recommended that you get, get yourself some thermal imaging equipment. FLIR, which is a company we use extensively, offers some great pieces of equipment which can turn your any smartphone into a thermal imaging piece of equipment. And this is great for spotting hotspots in control cabinets, which is a great early indicator of faults within a control cabinet. So if a contact is going or a relay is starting to go, or you've got a loose cable which is starting to arc, the first indicator of that will be a hot spot in your control cabinet. And this is a great chance to spot it before it creates a breakdown in your machine. Uh, Craig, before you, you move on, let me just uh, pick up one or two questions. Um, uh, as you're doing a, a preset checklist there and you're talking about belt tension, how do you know when you have a good belt tension? Uh, the easy way to tell is twanging it with your finger. So if a, if a belt moves, sorry, when you first start a machine up, if the belt slips, it's not tight enough. And if your, if your pulley or your main fan frame is deflected, so the alignment is not entirely plumb, so it's not perfectly vertical, then it's too tight. The sweet spot is somewhere in the middle of that. Now we do have a guide, which is in the, the rear of all of our Vida manuals, detailing the correct belt tension. In an ideal world, what you do is get yourself a belt tensioning tool, and this is a spring-mounted clip, which you push onto the belt until you get about two inches of deflection, and you're monitoring, so you're, you're then taking note of the amount of force it took to deflect the belt. And that, that is the measurement of a correct belt tension. And the belt tension should be taken uh, when the uh, fan is not running, correct, Craig? Absolutely correct. Yeah. It, in no point when you're inside the machine should the fan be running. That's it's basic health and safety. Okay. Very good. And uh, one last one on, uh, on uh, back to turning angles uh, before we move forward with uh, in a S3, a classic machine with a gen four controller, should the turning angles still be at about a minimum of 38 
And how often should the eggs turn? Is there a, a, a rule of thumb for that? And the industry, the industry standard for turn times is once every hour. Um, that there has been an amount of work done about turning more often to to recoup sort of things like uh, long egg storage duration. Um, but that's work that's been done in, alongside the work that spide, with Spidey's chambers, so pre-warming uh, or short periods of incubation during storage rather. Um, but by and large, the standard is once per hour. And, and yes, I'd always aim for at least 38 degrees on any machine. Very good, thank you. So fault logging. Um, by fault logging, what I mean is the record keeping for your maintenance department. Because hatchery maintenance, it's a job where if you do it right, nobody's really sure you did anything. Much like an IT job. And records phone the backbone of any maintenance. The reason being, if you're not sure what you've done, you're not sure what you're going to need to do. One of the main components of any fault logging or any, any record backbone is your technical literature. It's absolutely vital for hatcheries to have manuals and electrical schematics for your incubators on hand, hard copies. The reason for this is when you, if you have a breakdown in the middle of the night, out of hours or even during off office hours, the last thing you want to do is have to waste time trying to dig up drawings from, for an incubator that nobody's heard of for 20 years. Having those schematics on hand will save you, saves you critical hours when you can get straight into finding the fault rather than trying to find the drawings. Job sheets of, main, of any maintenance that's being carried out. So this is where you're physically recording what work you're, you're doing on the machines, whether it's preventative maintenance or reactive maintenance, it should all, all be recorded. So your preset checklists, what parts are you using? Are they, are they repairs that are carrying out that are critical or non-critical? Is it reactive or proactive? Breakdown and call out recording. How often are you coming out and for which alarms are you having to be called out? Calibration recording and scheduling. How often are you calibrating your machines and what was it last time you recorded those calibrated values? If you're still going around as a hatchery and, and manually recording your turn times, your turn counts rather, and your temperature monitoring on a periodic basis, maybe maybe the case that you don't have a maestro system set up, are you recording those values or do they just get pulled off the door and thrown in the bin at the end of each week? Those values should be recorded. And then if you have a problem further on down the line, you can go back to your files and prove that the incubation you've been carried out was good. And you can then focus the fault finding on another aspect of the hatchery. And a log of all the parts that are used, the reason for this is once you know which parts you've used historically, it's trivial to turn that into a forecast to budget for parts that you're going to use going forward. If you know day in, day out, month on month, you're using X number of probes, that's not going to change in the near future. So you can very easily give your management, you give your owners, your purchasing department, a list of probes that you're going to need in the next quarter coming up or the number of motors or bearings or silicon or door seals that you're going to be needing going up. And then rather than waiting for the parts to turn up, whilst FedEx figure out where your hatchery are and get the import duty sorted, those parts are sat on your shelf ready to go when you need them. Conclusions. So hatchery maintenance is critical. It can prolong the life of your machines, reduce unscheduled downtime, and increase your chick quality and hatchability. Calibration is critical to that. It's critical to a good hatch, it's critical to your hatchery. It should be carried out periodically, even without indicators, indicators of a bad production. It allows you to capture those faults before they're a problem. And fault logging provides critical information that will enable for accurate forecasting and targeted maintenance. Now that covers very broad strokes, what I deem necessary for basic maintenance in a hatchery. A lot of our seminars coming for, going forward will start to delve into a lot more detail on specific topics. If anybody's got any specific questions that you'd like me to address now, by all means, raise your hand or drop them into the text box. Okay, so we have a, a few more. Uh, thank you again to everybody. These questions are coming uh, all over the world. Um, back to uh, uh, the WIC. Uh, is the size of the WIC important in the uh, machine? 
Absolutely. There's two, two things when you're considering the wick size. The first is whether or not it's a snug fit on your probe. Um, over the years, we, there's been several different temperature probes that we've used. There's a long, thin probe and there's a, a short, stubby probe. The short, stubby probe especially requires a slightly larger wick size. Otherwise, you run the risk of the, the smaller wick. It can, it can pull apart and fray, and then you don't get a fully saturated probe, in which case you're not getting an accurate wet bulb humidity reading. The second portion that's important to get is the length of the wick. It must be fully submerged in the, in the water in the cistern throughout the cycle in the hatcher. If it's not, again, it runs the risk of drying out and it's not giving you an accurate reading. Now, having an oversized wick isn't as big of a problem as long as it's still saturating the probe, but it may be the case that you need to put a small clip or an elastic band on the wick just to hold it securely on the probe through that incubation cycle. All right, wonderful. Um, we've had a few requests here, uh, uh, people asking about the uh, belt tensioning tool. I don't know if you have a, a picture of one of those, uh, Craig. Uh, I will mention if you're looking one up uh, for a moment, um, Chickmaster does have a program called a proactive inspection program, a PIP program, uh, where we can come to your site and do an inspection and show you how to do a, a thorough inspection of your machine where we will uh, bring the tensioning tool and we bring a thermal camera uh, we can help show you how to do a calibration. And so uh, if that's a service that, that you would like, certainly reach out to us at support at chickmaster.com uh, and we'd be happy to, uh, to come and, and, and show you how to do this uh, as soon as we're allowed to travel uh, again to your sites. And so there on the screen is a picture of the uh, tensioning pin. Uh, any comment on that, Craig? Is, are, are they all created equal or uh, and do you recommend the something? There's a little bit of variation in them. Um, the, the bulk of the ones that you're going to find online after a quick search, when I think this is one, are the ones that you get for um, car belts, for cam belts in a car. Um, and they're, they're built slightly differently, and you can get different um, forces that they'll measure. But by and large, they, they all do pretty much the same job. Now, you're looking for, they all come with an individual guide. And again, as I said, it's in, it is in the back of our Aveda manual, exactly what you're looking for. But you're looking for about two inches of deflection with a known amount of force. So the rubber band on the shaft of this, you would move to the, the correct amount of force, and that's in newtons. And then you deflect the belt between the centers, sorry, between the, the two external diameters of the pulley by a known amount, and you're looking for that amount of force to have been used to deflect the pulley. Is there a standard amount of deflection you should be looking for when you're tensioning? Um, so the, the amount of deflection is always gonna be about two inches, but what differs between the machines and between belts is the amount of force it was required to get to that two inches. Okay. Um, and what you're going to find, especially on new belts, so in a machine where you've put a brand new belt and you're going to find that the, the amount of deflection, the amount of force there is far greater. Um, and then one you, what you're going to find is as the machine beds that belt in, so as it gets used to the machine, as it gets up to temperature and gets used, the belt will become a little bit slacker. So it's entirely normal that once you put a new belt on the machine, you have to readdress that and maybe lift the motor plate slightly just to retighten it again, maybe a week or two after it's been installed. Okay. Uh, we have a, another question. I'm not sure I understand the question. Let's see if you do. I, he says, uh, I mean, another way to check tension when the setter is running is we look at the monitor and look at the RPM every of every section and how many RPMs still can be tolerated. Yeah, absolutely right. So this for standard RPM on a on a setter on a single stage setter, sorry, without a VFD, you're looking for about 224 RPM. Obviously, if you've got a VFD installed on the machine, that's going to step down depending on what speed the VFD is doing. But what you're looking for ideally, and you're absolutely right, is the comparison between zones. This, this should all be about the same value. Now, if you have a very slack belt or a very tight belt, you'll see a difference in those RPM meters and those RPM readings put by zone. But it's not always the case that a, a belt that's slightly too tight or slightly too loose will give you that RPM indication. The belt, in my experience, the belt's got to be really too tight or really too loose by a fair margin before you'll see that on the screen. So getting a simple $20 belt tension tool and getting used to using it can save you an absolute fortune in the long run from replacing belts, replacing bearings, and ultimately replacing motors. Thank you. We had someone who joined the, uh, the webinar a little late. He's asking about a commit, uh, calibrating humidity in uh, the rock setter. 
um, any specific tools to do calibration of humidity? Yeah, so you can buy a, a RH, so relative humidity temperature uh, meter, um, and then you just leave it in the machine as you would a normal temperature probe. Um, long enough for the temperature readings to sorry the humidity readings to stabilize and then use that to calibrate or the alternative is to use the, the normal calibration kit that you have in, in the hatchery anyway so the rc2 um, but put a wick on there in order to give get yourself a wet bulb temperature reading once you've got that wet bulb reading you can convert it using the known temperature of the incubator and convert that very easily into an rh reading as well uh, we have a, a live question, a hand raised uh, from uh, Tanjung. Uh, Tanjung, I'm allowing you to talk if you would like. Uh, just unmute your microphone now and you can ask your question. And uh, while he is choosing whether to, or, uh, Tanjung, go ahead. <laughs> All right, we're Hi. Yes, how time. do we go ahead? How do we calibrate humidity in a single stage? Setter. In setter, I mean. Yes, yeah, so your single stage set is going to have that uh, dry humidity probe in it. So it's going to have the, the relative humidity sensor in. So you can either buy a handheld. Um, humidity probe so a handheld sensor and position that inside the machine next to the probe to ensure it's getting the same amount of airflow or the comparable airflow um, and calibrate it that way or you can use your standard rc2 calibration kit put a wick on it so it's saturated so it's wet and that will give you a wet bulb humidity reading you can then convert that into a rh reading to calibrate with Thank you, Craig. We have about five more minutes. Uh, we have a few more questions. Um, uh, do you know a tool to measure the angle of attack on fan blades? So the fan blades all come pre-calibrated. So they're all manufactured to a very high tolerance. Um, I, I don't know offhand, so I'll be honest, I, exactly what that angle is. But the, the biggest concern with fan blades, sorry, the biggest things to check with fan blades is A, that you've got three opposing blades. So you've got three facing one way, a left-hand blade, and three facing the other way, right-hand blade. And then the second thing to check is that they're, if the correct distance to the fan fail sensor, and every blade should be passing within four to six millimeters of that fan fail sensor. Now on a rock control, we've engineered that fan fail sensor out, and we monitor the load of the VFD to give us that same information. Um, but if your blades aren't, aren't t passing within close enough distance of that sensor, that's again going to impact your RPM reading on the screen. Now, it's important to note that whilst you turn it by hand, it may well be that the sensor is reading all of those blades. There is a small amount of deflection within that hub when it's up to speed. So you need to be absolutely sure that it's hitting all of those blades when it's up to speed as well. Thank you, Craig. Speaking of BFDs, uh, what could cause VFD failure to occur even when the fans are operating fine? The biggest problem that we have is twofold. It's, it's usually either down to the incoming voltage or it's down to the tension of the belt. So both of those reasons, well, so the VFDs are for backup moment. The VFDs are very good at giving you error codes when they fault. And what you'll often find is either um, overcurrent, so an overcurrent fault, and I can't remember what it is offhand, um, and that's because your belt's just too tight, so the motor's having to put in a lot of work in order to turn the pulley. Or equally, if your incoming voltage into the VFD isn't as clean as it could be, the VFD will shut itself down in order to protect itself. Okay, wonderful. Um, I don't see uh, other VFD questions right now. A couple uh, other calibration questions. Uh, for hatchers, when is the best time to calibrate temperature and humidity? Uh, 24 hours after transfer. Okay. Um, another question unrelated. Uh, how do you know when you need to change the power supply on an Allen Bradley G4 machine? So all of the power supplies that we supply have got a modulating or have got the ability to modulate the outgoing voltage from them. 
so in order to get ensure that you're getting a clean 24 volt there's a small diode on the front that you can tweak with a small electrical screwdriver so the easiest way to is to stick a multimeter on the outside of that and just make sure you're getting 24 volts if you're not you can change it up or down ever so slightly if you're unable to get a clean 24 volts by doing that so you no matter how high you change it you're still not reaching that 24 volts then it's time to replace that power supply equally as i mentioned earlier Thermal imaging UV control cabinets will give you a very good early indication of when components are starting to fail. And when you see that spike in temperature from a particular component, so it's going up to 60, 70, 80 degrees Celsius, that's when you want to start swapping that out before it causes a larger issue in your facility. Okay. Uh, we've had a few questions come in about whether you can order specific parts uh, from Chickmaster. Um, and the best uh, thing to do is either to email us at support at chickmaster.com or visit the parts.chickmaster.com website where you can search for uh, parts. Most of them have pictures uh, and descriptions uh, that, uh, and you can order straight online. In fact, there's a special going uh, in April. Uh, any parts that are ordered online have a 10% discount with those. Um, but feel free to, to call us or email us or check the website uh, for specific parts that you're looking for. Um, all right, uh, two more, and I think these will be our last two questions uh, today. Uh, how does incorrect humidity affect incubation in the setters? That's, that's a, a very good question. Um, and it's almost a seminar topic on its own because there's, there's so much information that can impact that. Um, so the, so the biggest problem is if you've got low humidity in the early stages, the amount of energy uptake by the egg mass is going to be that much lower. So it's going to take longer to get them up to temperature. But by and large, the biggest issue to, to my mind on humidity in the setters is around the weight loss of the eggs. So if you're looking for consistent 10, uh, 8 to 10% weight loss in your eggs um, and your humidity levels in your machines are too low, you're going to far and exceed the amount of weight loss that you're looking for. So your birds are going to be lethargic and underweight when they're, when they're transferred and when they're hatched. Um, equally, if your humidity is too high, your weight loss is going to be far too low. Um, and that's something you can see again with the lethargic chicks at the end, and they're still going to be very wet and a little bit green in those, those last few hours. But that, that's something that I'm sure we'll go into a lot more detail with on a, on a later seminar. And uh, if that was your question, a few people have asked similar questions about incorrect humidity and its effect on incubation. This is a perfect conversation to have with one of our incubation specialists. And, and we have those located all over the world uh, in every time zone. Uh, so if you'd like to reach out to us by emailing support at chickmaster.com, we'd be happy to connect you with a hatchery specialist who can talk about that uh, in your environment. So, and, uh, Let's see, uh, one more, and this will be the last question today. The rest we'll try to respond to uh, by email. Uh, you mentioned for hatcher calibration, it's better after 24 hours after transfer. Uh, if we do transfer at 18 and a half days and 19 days, is it any different result if we do the calibration after 24 hours? Um, well, it's a very late transfer. You're, you're going to come up against an issue where your temperature stability inside the machine isn't going to be great. Um, the birds are not, not that far away from starting to pip, so your humidity level is certainly going to be changing. Um, in that case, I'd tend to drag it forward a little bit more. So maybe do it 12 hours after transfer. Okay. Very good. Well, Craig, this is, has been wonderful. Um, and thank you to all of our guests around the world for your great questions. Uh, we are here to help you in any way we can. Uh, chick, uh, support at chickmaster.com again is the email address to get support or feel free to visit our website uh, where you can get a, a phone in number, a dial in number as well. We do have webinars uh, throughout the month on various topics uh, uh, that have to do with uh, incubation, uh, ventilation, um, mechanical, uh, uh, egg quality is coming up. So just a variety of things. And you can certainly visit our website, uh, www.chickmaster.com uh, to, uh, to see the schedule for those. So again, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and uh, thank you, Craig, uh, for hosting us. We really appreciate you. Uh, have a great day, everybody, and be safe. <laughs>